Best Buddies DVD collection now. We love the Best Buddies. Napping, 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 jello bit down. Songs for the whole family. Full of action. And pop it. songs that create a positive approach to learning valuable life skills like learning to share. It's not fun if it's not fun for everybody. It's not fun if it makes someone mad or blue. Learning to obey. We stop because it's catching. This happens every time I hear some chimney yapping. I think a chew. It's true. I'm These songs will entertain and teach your children how to really be best buddies. Enjoy all three of the original Best Buddies DVD collection, edited and remastered, and available on iTunes. And be sure to visit us at thebestbuddies.com to purchase your physical copy of the Best Buddies albums and videos. And receive the free digital download, parenting resources, blogs, lyric videos, and much more, all free. Designed for the Best Buddies family. Plus, you can download the Best Buddies theme song for free. And we can't wait to introduce you to the new Best Buddies with lots more great original music. For all updates on all things Best Buddies, follow us on social media. Remember, you can be a Best Buddy too! Bye-bye! <laughs>
then it really blows your mind. I mean, an ordinary Hebrew teenage girl who is visited by an angel and she's told, guess what? The Savior of the world is going to come through your womb. And she says, that can't happen. Said, I, I have not been with a man. And then the angel says something even more preposterous. He says, but what you don't understand is the spirit of the Most High God is going to come over you and is going to germinate that egg and you are going to be pregnant without ever having known a man. How many of you understand up until this point, it's already really difficult? How in the world do you wrap your brain around that? When the angel had finished the conversation, this is what Mary said. She said, let it be to me even as you have said. I'm all in. If this is God's purpose for me, I'm ready. Here's what you need to understand about the real purposes of God. You seldom will understand the impact of one word from God concerning your destiny. You will seldom get it all because it grows and morphs and multiplies so quickly. You say, but is there proof of God? Oh, my friend, if you are blind to the proof of God, then you are blind to your own emptiness. Because there's one thing I can guarantee you. You may have a job, you may have a career, and you may have a path ahead of you that you have carefully chiseled out with the help of consultants and books that you have read, but you do not have a purpose unless you know the babe in the manger, unless you have met the most high God. What you do does not have presence about it. It does not have eternity about it. But when he speaks to you, and he tells you just a measure of what he's going to do. I mean, what amazes me about the Bible is this, is how concise it is. You know, God knew that he was going to be dealing with ADD people. Because even the most profound doctrines of the Bible are in capsule form. And when you talk about Jesus being born into the world and that first conversation with Mary and the subsequent conversation with Joseph, it's such a short paragraph. Oh, my goodness. How in the world does that happen? That's because a word from God is so powerful that when it is germinated and when it begins to grow, it becomes something far greater than you ever dreamed it could become. So the first thing I would say to you today is it's important to hear your word from God. And if you haven't gotten your word from God, today would be the day when you need to open your heart wide and with desperation cry out to him, Oh God, don't leave me out. Give me a word for my life. Some people aren't ready for it. You know, the Bible says this, that people don't come to the light because they love darkness rather than light. Some of you love your weekends so much that you're not ready for a word from God. Some of you love your medicating, your drugs, your alcohol, your activities so much that you're not ready for a word from God. Some of you love society so much. The environment that you live in, the culture that you've created so much that you're not ready for a word from God. 
Some of you love your own silly ambitions so much that you're just not ready for a word from God. But this is what I'm going to tell you. If you ask him, he's going to give you a word. Sometimes he'll do it supernaturally. The word itself will become supernatural. I'll never forget, I was at a time in my life where I was very discouraged. I was a young preacher, single. That's why I was discouraged. I hadn't met Deonza yet. You can't be discouraged being married to Deonza. Do you know that? I mean, it's crazy. You know, some of you say, well, I wonder how she is in real life. She's like 10 levels above what you see on the stage. She encourages all of us all the time. Amen? She's wonderful. But I was single, lonely, deprived. And uh, <clears throat> preaching all over the place. And I went to see my uncle. And uh, I, I was just asking this question. God, do you really know where I am? Do you really have your eye on me? Am I somehow lost in the whole maze of the kingdom of God and the purposes of God and my own calling and just needed a word from God? And I, I just kind of casually threw it out. God, I'd, I'd really love to hear from you during this season. I, uh, I went to visit my uncle in San Antonio, Texas. And so he wanted to show me San Antonio. So they have that little river thing that winds through. It's not a river thing. It's a river that winds through San Antonio. And you can rent a little boat and get on this little boat, and this guy will take you through. And you're able to just basically ride and see nothing, but it's there people will ask you, have you done the river thing? Oh, yes, I did it. Wasn't it wonderful? Yes, it was nothing really. But on that day, I'm winding through the little maze and really not focusing on anything, listening to my uncle talk, who I love. And um, there's a guy that's sitting on the bank on a, a bench, like a park bench they had. It was like from, you know, it's, it's from me to you, Dan, and we're winding through, and he's right there on the bank, just sitting like you are. And he's got an old, torn-up Bible. He's by himself, and he's singing a hymn. Just singing. It, it was like, you, you know when you go through Six Flags rides, and they have like the pirate over there, you know, the mechanical pirate? <laughs> Ar -gar -gar -gar. Yeah. It, it was, it was like, it was like that guy, you know. Except it was a preacher guy. It was a preacher guy. I thought, well, this, you know, it's. But he, he wasn't looking at me. But then when we passed, he turned and his eyes met mine. And he said, "God bless you." And I couldn't keep my eyes off of him. And my uncle said. Oh, he's some kind of nut. <laughs> and, and I wrote it off. I went home that afternoon, and I sat in front of the television to watch the evening news. And when I sat there to watch the evening news, suddenly this on-the-beat reporter says, Today we were visited in San Antonio by a man of God. They didn't even give the guy's name. And they just showed, this roving reporter showed this same guy walking through the streets with his tattered Bible. And he's just preaching to people and smiling, and waving, just preaching and talking. And he said, this man was in San Antonio bringing joy to the da-da-da-da. And I'm just transfixed. I cannot believe that I just saw him on the bank. And now I'm seeing him on television. I left the next day on the plane, and I was sitting in my seat, and I look up, and coming down the aisle is the dude. Now 
even I know something's up, something's up, something's up. As we took off, he was sharing the word with someone and already beside him, and then he just lifted his hands and began to worship. And I thought, oh, God, are we, this plane's not going to make it, or was it? <laughs> After the plane had landed, or just when the plane was landing, he looks up over the seat because he was like over there across the aisle. Looked over the seat and he said, I need to see you. And I thought, of course you do. <laughs> of course you need to see me. I waited until everyone cleared out and then we met right there in the aisle. He gave me a list of scriptures. And he said, may I pray for you? I said, sure you can. He put his hand on my shoulder and he prayed for me. And then he looked into my eyes and he said this, I want you to remember, young man, that all of God's angels are praying for you. And then he walked out, and I said, well, I'm going to find that guy. I couldn't find him anywhere. You say, you think he was an angel? Yes, because angel means messenger. And whether he was celestial or he was on earth, he was a messenger of God. Just what I needed, a word, one word from God to encourage me in that season. Now, it was 1847, and in a small French town, there lived an old priest who wanted to do very, something very special for his church on Christmas Eve. You see, a word from God plays out in a desire in your heart, a desire in your heart to do what you can do in this season for God. You don't have a word from God until you want to do something for God. And when you want to do something for God, you have to do something that is within your wheelhouse. I've often had young men come to me and say, I want to do something for God. I said, what do you want to do? Well, I want to have a meeting in Independence Stadium, and I want to get every youth group in America there, and, and, I, and I want to get the, the singers from Hillsong, and I, I want them to come from Jesus' culture, and, and, and I would like for Franklin Graham to preach, and can you help me do this, Pastor? I said, absolutely not. That's totally out of my wheelhouse. I can't make any of that happen. But when you get a word from God, you want to do something. But this is what changes the world. When the little something that you do gets touched by the hand of God. And then it becomes far more than you ever dreamed. This priest knew a renowned poet by the name of Capot. And he called this friend of his and he said, I need you to write me a poem for Christmas Eve. Now, this is the whole object of this priest. I want to do something special for my parish. My people don't have much. I want to do something that will bless them. I would like to read a poem in my mass. So he calls this poet Capone. Now, this poet was more famous for being a poet than he was a saint. And so he really didn't know the Christmas story that well. So he turned to the Bible and he began to read the Christmas story and he was overwhelmed as he read the Gospel of Luke. He imagined. He put him there, as poets often do. You put yourself into a situation so you can feel something deeply and then you can allow others to feel it as well. And he imagined witnessing the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. What would that be like? And over the next several weeks leading up to Christmas, Capo pinned, O Holy Night. And he was so moved when he finished his poem that he thought, this can't just be a poem. This needs to be a song that will move the hearts of people everywhere. And Capoe contacted his dear friend and well-known composer, Adolph Charles Adams. Now, Adolph 
studied O Holy Night, and he couldn't help but be moved by the lyric. The, the poem was so powerful that this Jewish man who didn't even believe in the birth of the Savior, who didn't even believe the gospel story, who probably had been the object of ridicule by Christians in that day, had often been the victim of anti-Semitic behavior, suddenly the gospel of that song overwhelmed him. And he was moved by more than his friendship with Capote. He felt the Spirit of God as he read the beautiful words. So what has happened is the simple desire of a priest to give a small gift to his congregation of a red poem has resulted in the conversion of both an agnostic and a man who was a Jewish secularist. It was supposed to just be read one time in the Catholic Church, but it became a timeless classic that would be sung around the world in every language. Oh, holy night, long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope. The weary soul rejoices for tender breaks. A new and glorious morn fall on your knees. Oh, hear the angel voices. Oh, night divine. Oh, night when Christ was born. Oh, night divine. Oh, holy night. Oh, night divine. And yet, more than 150 years before the internet, this song went viral and was sung to the four corners of the earth. You say, well, how did that happen? There was a man by the name of John Sullivan Dwight, who was a graduate of Harvard College and Divinity School. The problem was he wanted to become a minister, but uh, and he had become actually a, a pastor in Northampton, Massachusetts. But for inexplicable reasons, every time he had to get up and speak, <laughs> he would get physically ill. And it's not funny, but that's my sense of humor. I'm sorry. And his, his condition magnified to such an extent that he would lock himself in his home and he became a recluse, a trained preacher but scared to death to preach. As an accomplished writer, he founded something that he could do behind closed doors and out of the public eye. He founded Dwight's Journal of Music. And for over 30 years, he wrote, collected, and quietly edited his publication. And in his research, he came upon this very unknown French song called, Oh Holy Night. And he loved the song and thought it would be a wonderful Christmas song for America. So he set about it to get it translated. The song, however, moved him beyond the story of the birth of Christ as he read these words, truly he taught us to love one another. His law is love and his gospel is peace. Chains shall he break for the slave is our brother. And in his name all oppression shall cease. Sweet hymns of joy in grateful chorus raise we. Let all within us praise his holy name. With America steeped at that moment in civil war, Dwight believed that Christ came to free all men. He immediately began to translate O Holy Night from French into English for the very first time, and it spread like wildfire, and it was sang during the civil war. It was, according to historians, one of the great rhetorical influences on the ending of that conflict. Later in 1871, in the midst of fierce fighting between the armies of Germany and France during the Franco-Prussian War, 
a French soldier on Christmas Eve suddenly jumped out of his muddy trench. Both sides stopped firing and stared as this seemingly crazy man boldly stood with no weapons and he raised his eyes and hands to heaven and he began to sing. Truly, he taught us to love one another. His law is love and his gospel is peace. Chains he shall break for the slave is our brother and in his name all oppression shall cease. Sweet hymns of joy in grateful chorus raise we. With all our hearts we praise his holy name. Christ is the Lord. Then ever, ever praise we. His power and glory evermore proclaim. His power and glory evermore proclaim. The, the fighting stopped. It's historical record. As German and French soldiers joined in singing from those foxholes. O oh, holy night in their languages. For the next 24 hours, both sides observed a temporary peace and truce in honor of Christmas Day. Then on Christmas Eve, 1906, Reginald Fessenden, a 33-year-old university professor in Pittsburgh and former chief chemist for Thomas Edison, did something long thought impossible. Using a new type of generator, Fessenden, spoke into a microphone, and for the first time in history, folks, a man's voice was broadcast over the airways. It was the birth of radio. And it came to pass in those days, this was the message, the first words heard ever over the airways. The first time anyone ever heard anything broadcast. This was what was broadcast. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place when Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth under Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. So it was to be registered with Mary. And while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no room for him in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. The very first words heard over the radio. That story. A beginning in technology that would sweep the world framed by the beginning of the life of a Savior that would transform the world. To those listening to this broadcast, they were astonished. Some believed actually they were hearing a voice of an angel. Can you imagine? There is no way that Fessenden could have known the sensation that he was causing on ships and offices and homes as men and women were rushing to their wireless units to catch this Christmas Eve miracle. And after finishing his reading, of the birth of Jesus Christ according to the gospel of Luke. He picked up his violin, and the first music that was ever heard ever across the airwaves, ever across a transmission, wasn't Beyonce. 
wasn't Michael Jackson. No. He picked up his violin and he began to play Oh Holy Night. Now it's pretty amazing, isn't it? <laughs> that this all goes back to just one moment when a priest that no one would ever hear of except for this song decided that on Sunday morning for Christmas, he would love to just do something good for his people. Just wanted to give them a simple gift. Maybe if I could read a poem about Christmas. And that's the way the will and the purpose of God is. It never starts large. It never starts great. You can never get your brain around it when you receive that first word from God. But oh, it morphs and grows and becomes far more than you ever dreamed. Just one word from God is all you need to begin your life over again today. To begin a new direction that you have never known before. Just one word from God today. And Ten years from now, in 20, or six months from now, you will be amazed at what one word from God will become. Oh, holy night. It was a holy night. Because only the holy presence of God could take a word given to a young virgin and a young blue-collar worker and cause that word to bring the world into celebration every December. They might call it Xmas, but folks, they can't deny. <laughs> this is all about him. And it all started with a word from God. Stand with me, please, all over this place.